Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another one of our summer chapels, online chapels here at Dallas Seminary. Our speaker today is using a pseudonym since he serves in South Asia with his family. Ernest St. Victor has uh, served in South Asia since 2007. He has one daughter, 13, and one son who is 11 years old, who both homeschool. He leads a team of local and international believers in spreading the gospel, developing disciples, planting churches, and training leaders. He has a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of Georgia. He and his wife both earned THMs from Dallas Theological Seminary. And he earned his PhD in 2019 from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is the author of a series of theology books for children called Big Thoughts for Little Thinkers, and he blogs at gofarzio.com. He loves drawing, reading, traveling, and writing in his spare time. I'll never forget when I was about 11 years old, my dad lowering me head first by my ankles into a dumpster. We lived in a neighborhood that didn't have trash pickup. So a couple times a week, we'd have to put all the trash in the trunk and take it down to the dumpster. On this one occasion, I was with my dad, and when he threw the garbage bag into the dumpster, when he let go, he let go of the car keys that were also in his hand. So I had to go head first into the dumpster and try to find the keys. Maybe you feel like you are going head first into a dumpster. Maybe you feel like your life is a dumpster fire. We're in the middle of a global pandemic, Last night, there was a huge cyclone that came through South Asia. There are swarms of locusts, killer bees, political and civil unrest, and endless Zoom meetings. What do you hold on to in hard times? What do you believe about God? When you come through a time of suffering, is your faith stronger or is it in shambles? Reveling in your relationship with God as Father. It's one of the keys to enduring hardship. We get to call God Father. It's an amazing privilege, something so marvelous, but I think we often lose sight of it because it's familiar. But it certainly wasn't familiar to Jesus' original audience. On a couple of occasions, the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus because he had called God Father. Since 2007, my family and I have lived in South Asia, and we've worked in a Muslim context. And when you compare what Muslims believe to the great privilege we have of calling God Father, it really stands out. Islam kind of acts as a foil to Christianity. When you compare and contrast what kind of relationship they have with Allah and what kind of relationship we have with God, you can appreciate how valuable and precious it is to call God Father. Several years ago, I went to a local college to pass out tracts and try to engage students with the gospel. I passed out a bunch of tracts, but as I remember, I didn't have really any significant conversations that day. But about a week later, I got a phone call. Two young Muslim men introduced themselves and they said, were you at the college recently? And I said, yeah. They said, you gave a booklet to a friend of ours. He read it, hated it, tore it up and threw it away. Well, we found the pieces, taped it back together, and your number was on the back page. We want to know more. Can you meet with us? So I started meeting with these two young guys, Shubo and Shaquille. I usually met with them together, but on one occasion, I was in a park meeting with Shaquille one-on-one. -on -one, and I had given him a Bible, and I asked him to look up Luke 15. I had not given him any explanation, no exposition or context. I just asked him to read the story of the prodigal son. And as he read it, he started to weep. And when he finished reading the story, he looked at me with tears in his eyes. And he said, if I did that, my dad would never accept me home. Seeing God portrayed as a loving father in Luke 15 shook Shaquille to his core. Because Muslims don't have a concept of the fatherhood of Allah. In fact, it's forbidden, haram. They see it as blasphemy to call Allah father. They relate to Allah as slaves to a master. They don't have that personal, familial, 
relationship that we enjoy because for them, Allah is not personal or familial. And since Allah is not father, he doesn't adopt children. They don't have a concept of theological adoption like we do. And they don't practice civil adoption either. They have a guardianship system for orphans, but the child is not allowed. He's forbidden from getting any kind of inheritance or taking the family name of his caregivers. I started to dig into some of the reasons why Muslims don't have a concept of adoption. And you can trace it all the way back to Muhammad and the Quran in chapter 33. The short version is this. Muhammad never had male offspring that survived past adolescence. So he adopted a young man named Zayed. Eventually, Zayed married a woman named Zainab. Well, Muhammad wanted to marry Zainab, so he had his son divorce her. Well, when Muhammad took Zainab, this caused a great scandal in the community because you're not allowed to marry your son's wife even if they got a divorce. So Muhammad gets revelation from Allah saying that adoption is forbidden and that adoption was null and void. Muhammad disowns Zayed, marries Zainab, and then sends Zayed to the front lines of battle where he was killed. I encourage you, if you ever get a chance to talk to Muslims about the gospel, emphasize the fatherhood of God. Because in this doctrine, we can offer Muslims something that they don't find in Islam. The fatherhood of God opens the way for us to have union and communion with God and assurance of our salvation. When I was neck deep in writing my dissertation during the most intense academic undertaking of my entire life, God touched me with a profound truth that I want to share with you. At one point in my studies, I had to close my computer, lay my head on my desk, and just weep and worship God. You know that even though the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, Jesus predominantly spoke Aramaic. I think there's evidence that he also spoke Greek, and it's possible that he spoke Hebrew and Latin too. Now for Americans, that might seem far-fetched because we only speak one language, American. But for people in South Asia, it's quite common to speak two or three or even four languages. Many uneducated villagers can speak more languages than most Americans. But my point is this. Several times in the Gospels, we come across something really special. An example appears in Mark 14, 36, where we don't have a translation of what Jesus said, but we have what scholars call the ipsissima vox, the very words of Christ. In Mark 14, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying that the Father would take the cup away from him. And he prays, Abba, Ho Pater, Abba Father. Here's what undid me. When I was sitting in my little study, surrounded by commentaries and journal articles, I was looking at Romans 8.15, and I was reading the International Critical Commentary by Cranfield, one of Dr. Honer's favorite commentaries. And Cranfield makes the point that in adoption, the Spirit takes the very words of Christ and puts them on the lips of believers. Listen to what Romans 8.15 says. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. It just blows my mind that we get to call God by the very same words that Jesus used to address his heavenly Father. Jesus brings us into the same relationship that he has always enjoyed with his heavenly father for all eternity. I know that some people have a hard time conceiving of God as father, maybe because they didn't have an earthly father, or maybe they had a bad relationship with their earthly father. But even if you had a good earthly father, you still don't want to get the order wrong. You've got to start with God as the model of fatherhood. He's the pattern, and all human fatherhood should be patterned after him. God is the eternal father in eternal relationship with God the Son. And then we get invited through adoption to participate in the sonship of Jesus. Now, 
Here's where the rubber meets the road. If we fail to revel in our relationship with God as Father, we're vulnerable to falling away. And it's actually the history of Islam that provides a vivid illustration of what I'm saying. Let me explain. When historians look at the first couple centuries after Muhammad, Islam exploded and just spread like crazy over Arabia and North Africa. So historians have to ask, what factors were at play here? And why did so many Christian communities, places that had been Christian for centuries, why did they capitulate so quickly to Islam? How can you explain why so many Christian communities converted to Islam? Now, you might point to economic factors, and, and that certainly played a role. The Christians didn't want to pay the tax on non-Muslims, but that's only part of the story. You might say that Islam spread by the sword, and, and that happened some, but not as much as you might think. You might point to political, uh, racial, linguistic factors, and those were all at work. But that's only part of the story. There's a significant theological dimension that historians often overlook, and it's this. Most of the Christian communities that converted to Islam were heretical. So when Islam came along preaching a strict monotheism, but continuing to pay homage to Jesus as a great prophet and to Mary as a virgin, the heretical Christians really couldn't tell much difference between, say, Arianism and what Islam was teaching. They could find no compelling reason to bear the steep cost of remaining Christian. But in my research, I found that there were some Christian communities that withstood the onslaught of Islam and did not cave in to the pressure to convert. What was different about them? By and large, Trinitarian communities in Arabia and North Africa remained faithful to Christ. We have a real world historical example that orthodoxy helps protect against apostasy. When you go into the ministry, don't you want to protect your people from falling away? As a mom or dad, don't you want to help your children remain faithful to Christ no matter what? In your own life, don't you want to put things in place so that you don't fall away? You need to know God as your Heavenly Father through the Son and the Holy Spirit. When you are facing hardship, it makes all the difference if you know God as Heavenly Father. Knowing God and reveling in your relationship with Him as Father is key to enduring hardship. When I was dangling by my ankles head first in a dumpster, I knew my dad had me. He wasn't going to drop me. I never doubted for a second that he loved me and made all the difference. So when I was rummaging around through the eggshells and the, the, all the dirty muck and trash, I wasn't afraid. Finally found the car keys and he pulled me up was covered in goo and guck and finally uh, got home, got showered off. But I don't resent my dad for making me go through that. It's a funny memory. We look back on it and laugh. Now, of course, my illustration breaks down because we never have to suffer because God made a mistake. God never metaphorically drops his keys in the dumpster. But we do go through hard times and it makes all the difference to know that your heavenly father loves you. We come to know that through faith in Christ, and we're brought into union with the eternal Son of God and adopted, and we become children of God. He gives us all the rights and privileges, all the blessings, all the assurance, all the empowerment. So no matter what you're facing, if you feel like you're going headfirst into a dumpster, you can cry out by the Spirit, Abba, Father, and rest assured that He's got you safe in His arms.